<coughs> the pool. Got to have a pool. They have a lot of hydrating stations as well, so. But still, I mean, that means you go there and you sit. It's not your own home. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Good morning, Diana. Let me wave to you. There you go. <laughs> if you're in the neighborhood, you want to come by and join us. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today, if you'll grab your Bibles, we will be in the book of Revelation, chapter 4. Chapter 4. Roughly, uh, well, exactly 11 verses. Not a long chapter, but a powerful chapter. So grab your cup of coffee and join us. If you're out there working today, drink lots of water. It's supposed to be 117 today. Probably it, that, which probably means, and I remember working in Palm Springs, they would tell us it's going to be 115. But the reality was they didn't want to tell you that it was really 125. So that means it's probably going to be right around 120 today. So very, very hot for those of you that are out. Use your air conditioners. Drink lots of water. If you're working out there, then drink lots, lots of water, even if you don't feel like it. Because you can get dehydrated really quickly. So we don't want you fainting and getting into trouble. So, Well, there's a couple of you on here, so let's go ahead and and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, Lord. Thank you for your grace and for your love that has been shed abroad upon this world, Lord. Even if the world does not acknowledge it, you definitely, Lord, has have been faithful to shed your love upon us, Lord, just in the beauty of nature itself, Lord, and the oxygen that we breathe, Lord. The things that we see that just speak of a creator, a beautiful creator who loves us so much, Lord. And we come before you this morning, Lord, just asking for an anointing of the Holy Spirit. That he would be our teacher. And he would illuminate the scriptures to us, Father. And Lord, that you would use me as a vessel just to minister uh, to your people and children, Lord. And as we approach chapter 4 that you give us understandings and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us, Lord. We don't have to fear the tribulation period as believers. I believe that we will be out of this world before that day starts. The rapture will take place, the church will be removed, and then the great wrath of God will come upon this world. Thank you for being faithful, Lord. I guess if you were to give an analogy of that, you could say that a town that is about ready to be um, inundated with some sort of disease and just will wipe as many people out as possible, and yet there's a few that are warned to get out of there, and they're removed, and the town is filled with this disease. That is what the rapture would be like. We would be removed and your wrath would begin. But we're safe and sound in heaven uh, with our Lord and Savior until the second coming of Christ. Lord, <clears throat> we ask that you would bless everyone today and just keep them safe, Lord, in this heat. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. Let's see who else. Good morning, Allie. Glad you could join us. Oh, wrong one. Dina, trying to see who else is there. Oh, Moses from India is there. Thank you for joining us, Moses. Glad to have you all the way from India, from Hyberdad. If you know where Hyberdad is in India, I hope to go there soon and visit Moses. If you're interested in helping me out in, in them, uh, appreciate any donations you can just go to our church website and donate there to the, our india missions trip coming up here this year so 
All right, Revelation chapter 4. Let's get into it. So let me just uh, recap so we understand where we're at in time. Um, John, in, in chapter 1, gave us the outline. We've already seen in chapter 1 uh, the things uh, that were and then the things that are in chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches that he speaks about. And now we get to the next part of the outline, the things which will take place after this. And that is the things that we, we have seen. So chapter 4 all the way to chapter 22 are the things that will take place after the tribulation uh, begins and the beginning of the rapture that takes place and then we're taken out and then these things will take place. Uh, so from chapter four all the way to 22 are all the things will be happening during the tribulation period, whether in heaven or whether on earth. So there's two places that these things will be taking place in heaven and God orchestrating all of these things or whether on earth where these things are being fulfilled according to the scriptures, whether dealing with Israel, mainly dealing with Israel on the earth and in heaven, dealing with the believers, Israel and the Jewish uh, Gentile believers that have been raptured or have already gone to heaven and the things that will be taking place uh, with all of them. And then in verses, I'm sorry, chapters four and five, we have a scene of worship in heaven. So these next two chapters here uh, reveal to us this great worship session of God, of the church, of the Jews, and of uh, many people that will be worshiping God. So chapter four, we see a picture of the throne. Now who sits on the throne? Obviously God. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. He's making intercession for us, the Bible says. So you have this picture in the heavenly realm, God sitting on the throne, his son sitting next to him. And then you're going to have other thrones. You're going to have other beings around here. You're going to have a lot of worship. You're going to have a lot of uh, um, praise and adoration and honor that is taking place. So now, verse 1, after these things, I looked, stop, circle that. That's where you write the little word rapture, after these things. That's where the rapture takes place. Boom, after the rapture, these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Remember, the trumpet was an archangel sounding. Speaking with me, saying, come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. After what? The rapture. So again, this angel, and apparently they, they speak, and it's like the sound of a trumpet. Um, we're going to see that Thessalonians. How that sounds, I don't know. Um, I don't think anyone knows. But when that sound of the trumpet goes off in the world, all believers will hear it, and rapture will take place. And the Bible says, in a twinkling of an eye, not a blink. A blink is slower than a twinkle. You, I, I believe they say that uh, a blink and a twinkle are a difference of about a, a thousandth of a second. I mean, just that much faster. And so that much faster and we're in the presence of the Lord. And I love what someone said. It's like opening a door and then closing it behind you and boom, you're there. But faster than that, you're in the presence of God. So the angel will, will, will sound his trumpet, will be raptured. And then at that point, John says that this angel with a trump calls him and says, come up here, and I'm about to show you what is to take place after these things. So verse two, immediately I, that is John, was in the spirit. So he's dreaming, having a vision of some sort. Um, is he leaving his body? Is he astral projecting? I don't think so. That's demonic. That is stuff that happens in the evil spiritual world, not in God's kingdom. And I'll tell you for one good reason. The Bible says that our bodies are our temple and they house our souls. And so if our soul leaves our body, that means we have an empty temple. 
and anything could happen to that temple. An evil spirit can come in and take it over or something like that. And the Bible talks about that. We, we have pictures of that in Genesis chapter 6. We have pictures of possession throughout the Gospels and Jesus having to deliver them. So this so whole idea of astral projection and astrology and so forth, that doesn't happen with believers. We are always in our house. We may have a vision or a dream, and that's probably what is taking place here, but we will not leave our bodies. Absent from the body is present with the Lord, the Bible says. So he's having this vision or this dream in the spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat up on that throne. Again, a picture of God. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. What does a rainbow represent? God's promise, right, to never flood the earth again. So it has to do with God, obviously. Uh, a jasper, a sardis, what do these represent? Well, I think, and, and some have tried to suggest that they're Israel because there are certain stones. Remember the 12 stones that are on the priest and they all wear them and each stone, each stone um, is a representation of one of the tribes of Israel. And so some have tried to suggest, well, maybe the Jasper is this tribe of Israel and the, and the Sardis is another tribe. But I think if you just basically go back to Revelation 21, 11, you'll find that it talks about the glory of God like a, like, like a Jasper, like Sardis, like light and shining. So I think it's just giving us a picture of God's glory illuminating the throne of God, a rainbow around there of colors and, and so forth. So uh, not too much more than that. I think we need to be careful and not draw too many subjections there and use the Bible to interpret the Bible. So Revelation 21, 11 speaks of the glory of God. Verse four, around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their head. So again, you see this picture, you have God on the throne, Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Then you have 12 thrones around there, uh, 24, 12 on one side, 12 on the other. Who could that be speaking of? Take a guess. Anybody, just shout it out. <laughs> tribes of Israel. Okay, the tribes of Israel, and there were 12 tribes of Israel. How many, how many disciples were there? 12. 12, so 12 and 12. But is that true? Is that true? How do we know if that's true? Or maybe it's a bunch of angels at that time. Um, but there are 12 disciples. There are 12 um, tribes of Israel. Oh, but wait a minute. Judas hung himself. So how could you say there was 12? Paul the apostle replaced Judas. So it could be that Paul is one of the 12 that sits upon the throne. And didn't Jesus tell Peter that they would have the gates of Hades? You know, And upon this rock himself, he would build the gates. So they have some authority, by the way as apostles. They do have authority. God has given them that authority. So can we prove that? Well, this 24 elders sitting, that phrase is mentioned um, 27 times throughout the Bible. And um, there is one area, if you look to verse 10, and just You'll make a, a, an interpretation here, but look at verse 10. The 24 elders fell down before him. So obviously these are falling down before him who sat on the throne. So these are some sort of creatures falling down before the throne, whether they're angelic or whether they're men. And it says they're worshiping him who lives forever and ever and ever. And what are they doing? And cast their what? Crowns before the throne. Who are going to receive crowns? The Bible talks about men receiving crowns and rewards from heaven. So I believe that there's enough information here to suggest that it's Israel and the 12 tribes who receive crowns. And of course, they'll cast their crowns back to, to the Father as they worship him in heaven. So, all right, verse 5. And from the throne proceeds lightning, thunders, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, we already know what the seven lamps are, right? You remember? <laughs> you guys forgot already. The seven churches. And they all have the spirit of God. So the seven spirits. Not that they're seven spirits, but they're all filled with the spirit of God. So these, these churches there uh, are, are in his presence. Um, and again, the, the throne proceeding with lights and thunderings, just a glorious appearing 
Um, I don't think that it, it will be a fearful experience. I believe that it's going to be an awe reverence type of experience where you're going to go, <laughs> this is like, like John and Peter in the Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, build us a tabernacle here that we would just stay here for the rest of our lives. We don't want to leave. Here you are and the Father, and this is, this is where we should be. <laughs> so it's going to be a great experience uh, for, for these uh, 24 elders there before the throne of God. Now, verse 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were 20 living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. All right. So before the throne, there's like a sea of glass. Um, is it the ocean? Is it gold? Some, uh, there's another place that says that the streets will be paved with gold. So we really don't know. It's, it's, it's a vast openness, looks like a sea, and it's just crystal clear glass. And it's there with these um, celestial beings, these, these four living creatures that have full of eyes front and back. Now, what are they? Um, they are probably cherubims. We have two choices. Um, they're either cherubims or they're representations of the four gospels. Some <coughs> have suggested that it's the four gospels. <coughs> I don't think it's the four gospels. It's nice to see that there's uh, a, uh, a theme within each of the Gospels that may pertain to these things, and, and I don't have time to get into that. But I think these are really cherubims that are before the throne of God, and I get that from Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 14, also chapter 10, 122. Uh, some of our founding fathers like uh, Augustine and Jerome agree that these were, were cherubims at that time. You can also look in Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, verse 15, so 14 and 15. And you see the wheel in Ezekiel. And some people, oh, look, there's aliens and they have a spaceship. No, those are angelic beings. It's amazing what people come up with. Anyway, so these are cherubim who are before the throne also. The first living creature was like a lion. Now here's where they get the themes for each of the Gospels. So the first living creature, and this is Matthew, is like a lion. Now Matthew presents Jesus' genealogy, right? He's the son of David, and so the lion of Judah, the king, and the lion represents the power, the authority, and, and so forth. The second living creature is a calf. Uh, a calf is one who does service, who does work. Who, who, and Mark presents Jesus that way, the Son of God, and he's come to serve and not to be served. So we have a picture of, of Mark's gospel there. The third living creature has a face like a man. Now, now Luke presents Jesus as the Son of God or the Son of Man. And so he was born a man, 100% man, uh, tempted as man, was tempted in every point, but yet did not sin. So again, a picture of Mark's gospel. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. A flying eagle, again, um, John's gospel uh, presents Jesus as deity. Uh, he's almighty God in the flesh. And so that eagle, not sure exactly the eagle having that status, that power, authority, you know, in a sense. So this is where, where they get the idea of possibly this is representing the gospels. Or it could be that these are cherubims that are in charge of, of those gospels. But we really don't know, and I can't say for sure, so don't believe me on that, please. Verse 8. For the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying... Imagine that. They don't rest day or night. So that tells me that when we get to heaven, Susan, we won't get tired. <laughs> Where we want to just go lay down for a while. There is no time in heaven. There, there, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there is no tiredness. You will be able to go 24-7. Well, if there's no time, you'll be able to go for eternity. And so these angelic beings, these cherubs, are constantly before the throne, and they're constantly saying something on this throne. And what are they saying? Look at the next statement. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, they're just saying this over and over. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And I can almost imagine them as time is going on, this is just becoming a song and a tune, and everybody is whistling along with them. You know, just an amazing time. It speaks of worship from the heart. This is not about leading worship. This is not about performing in front of somebody. This is about the heart worshiping their Savior, Jesus Christ and God Almighty. This is about a transformed heart, a new heart that, that has archaic, archived the old life and said, I want to live a new life. This is the heart that says, I want to be right before God. I want to do everything right before God because he is holy, holy, holy. Some suggest the three holies to represent the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you can imagine, holy, 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 as they're looking at each one, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, must have been, an, it, it, it is going to be an amazing scene for us. But you see the heart, and, and can I stop just for a second here and, and get to that? point for each of us as individuals. You know, we're believers in Christ Jesus, or we profess to be believers in Christ Jesus. We've asked him to come into our heart. I hope you have. If you haven't, you need to, because it means that you haven't received Jesus in your heart. You haven't surrendered your life to him, and chances are you'll be separated for eternity, and we're going to see this as we go through the book of Revelation. There is a hell, a fiery pit that's been prepared for the angel and for those who reject Jesus Christ. And I definitely don't want to see you go there. Neither does God want to see you go there. But if you do not receive Jesus Christ, you, you will be going there. Um, so it's important to understand this, that you have to be born again. That means that you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. You become a believer that is filled with the Holy Spirit and has a hunger and a desire to worship God. And in that worship form of God, it's being pleasing to God, being obedient to God, surrendering our lives to God. I know that doesn't make sense. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it on Sunday because it doesn't make sense that we're sinners, that we're that bad. How can I be that bad? It feels like I do good things, but yet the Bible says that you're wretched and you're no good at all. There's this nature in you that just battles. It's with you. It consumes you continually and you can't get rid of it. And it's hard for us to really grasp because we're not used to hearing that. We're used to hearing that you're, you know, you're good and you can do good and so forth. And I get that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And there's a point where you surrender your life and say, I have to believe what the Bible says and not what I feel and not what I've heard before. And the feelings part is so deceiving. And that's why we have to use the Bible as a grid of truth. So when a heart is changed, it will be sensitive to sin. Let me say it that way. When a heart is changed, it will be sensitive to sin. Uh, my granddaughter is lactose intolerant right so she can't have dairy products as soon as she has dairy product she knows it because she's sensitive to dairy products she can see a dairy product she can want a dairy product and she can eat the dairy product and she does but she suffers afterwards and that's what sin is when we are born again we become sensitive to sin so when we approach sin, we know it's wrong. We can probably have it. We'll suffer the consequence knowing it, and we'll probably fall into it. Or we can say, no, that's wrong, and I don't want to do it because I know it's bad for me, and it will hurt me or harm me or, or you know, put me through a couple of days of bad stuff, you know, and so I need to push against it. So you become sensitive to sin. We're sensitive to pepper. If I start throwing some pepper in there, you know what will happen? Everybody will start sneezing here because we're sensitive to pepper. Uh, our senses picks it up and says, uh-oh, there's something foreign in us and we got to get it out psh, 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 till it gets out. Same with sin. There's something foreign going on in my heart. There's something foreign going on in my life. I need to get rid of it. That's being sensitive to sin. And so they stood around the throne saying, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever, verse 9, whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who sat on the throne and worshiped him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, 
You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And so the 24 elders, which is Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, and also the apostles, his disciples will be there. They will fall on their faces. They will cast their crowns before the Lord. And they then will be singing along with the archangels. I can almost see that. Someone needs to come up with a song like that where, where there's one group singing, Holy, Holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. And then the other group saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist exist and were created. That would be a beautiful song going back and forth. So you can imagine all of that. And these again, the, the, the cherubs, the disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel, and anyone else that is in heaven will cast their crowns before their Savior because they know they're not worthy to receive them. Even the good works that they've done through the power of God and through His Holy Spirit, they're still not worthy to receive them. They know that in their hearts. Lord, I'm just glad to be here. Like I, I like what David said. You know, David was a man after God's own heart. His heart was broken. And, and we can never come to God unless our hearts are broken. We have to experience a contrite spirit, as, as the psalmist said in Psalms 51. And that was David. <clears throat> you know, he, he... God blessed him with everything. Everything. His kingdom was powerful. And he was ready to build God a temple. And when he should have been out there fighting the battles with his men, he was on top of his fortress overlooking his kingdom in pride. And he sees a young lady, Bathsheba, bathing on the top of her roof. And he began to lust for her. And he couldn't stop thinking about it. And then he sent for her. And as her husband was out in the battles, he laid with her and she became impregnant. Now that alone, that alone should convict a person of sin. But he was so consumed with that lust and that sin and her beauty that he couldn't think of anything else. And he gave in to that, that sin that was there. And it didn't stop there. And this is how sin is. Sin grows and continues to grow and grow until it brings death. When she got pregnant, David tried to cover it up. Let's bring Uriah back and let's send him home so he can lay with his wife and they'll think that it's their child. That was his scheme. Uriah was such an honorable man to the kingship and to David that when David sent him home, he didn't go home. David opened the door to this kingdom and there was Uriah sleeping on the floor. He says, how can I go when my men are out in battle? Wouldn't go home. And so David thought of another plan. It gets worse. Sin grows. And so he told his men, I want you to send Uriah to the front. And when we were pushing forward against the enemy, I want you to call the men back and let Uriah go forward. So they kill him. And so they did that. And Uriah was dead. And after a time of mourning, this is the deception of sin. <laughs> no one needs to know in my kingdom what I've done. He marries Bathsheba and they have the child. And the child dies. There's, there's the wages of sin. Their first child dies because of their sin. Now, David still has a heart for God. He still loves God, still wants to build him a, a, a temple and so forth. I mean, he has a heart for God. He loves God. But this sin that dwells in our nature has consumed him. And it wasn't until finally God sent Nathan. And Nathan tells the story of this owner who took a little lamb from a farmer. It wasn't his. And he took it by force. And he consumed it for his, his own, for his own self. And David stood up and said, how dare that man? He was angry and said, find that man and we'll take care of that man. And that's when Nathan said, David, you're that man for you took Bathsheba. Can you imagine the conviction that he had at that very moment? And he just went, Whoo! and he was broken at that point. It didn't stop the repercussions of sin. Sin went on and he suffered a lot by his own family, by his children and so forth. But he still had a heart for God. He still had a heart for God. That's what sin does. 
we're sensitive to sin. We're sensitive to sin, and we need to respond when God is saying, you need to stop living that way. You need to live right. You need to stop doing that. You need to stop doing this. Not because it's a religious rule, but it's harming you. In the end, it will bring destruction. That's why God came to this world, to save us from that. If we'll have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, He will change your life. I hope that you'll hear what the Spirit is saying this morning. Because the Lord is coming back soon and we want to be ready for Him. Thank you for viewing Devo 30 with us. Please share this Devo. You never know who might hear it, might be touched by it. And someone literally might get saved into the kingdom of God and spared from eternal damnation. So please share this on your wall. God bless you. Have a, have a blessed weekend. Stay cool today, please. Uh, drink lots of water. If you have nowhere to worship, nowhere to come and, and fellowship, then come join us here at Calvary Chapel Inland. We'd love to have you here. Uh, we're going through a transition ourselves, and we're looking for men and women that are servants, that have a heart for God, to serve God, and to literally be active in the kingdom. Not just for people to come and fill a spot, but people that come and say, I want to be active in God's kingdom. And that's who God is looking for, men that are moved by the Spirit of God. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful weekend.